All right, Daniel Harris is with us. Um, Daniel, this is a, a question of after the Lord Mayor's show and the massive high that they had during the week that they're not quite ready yet as a squad to deal with that type of thing or is this just, this is how the Premier League works, you come up against really good teams who are well organised to uh, get a bit of a rub of the green against you and you're going to lose some games? Um, I think a, f a few of those things. It's hard to really know how much there was uh, a mental, emotional, physical dump from Wednesday night. On the other hand, there's no real excuse for the way that United started that game. There weren't the formation wasn't right, but they also didn't start with the level of energy that you would expect them to start with. Don't want to come over all Jurgen Klopp. Also would say the wind probably made a difference in that De Gea, when he was clearing the ball, couldn't get it to the halfway line. Could be that he just can't kick the ball hard enough with those kind of stringy legs that he has, because Zeno didn't seem to have the same trouble when they swapped ends, although I think the wind had dropped a bit subsequently. But I did think that made a difference, because every time United had the ball, they then couldn't keep possession from the goal kick. So there was a little bit of that. But on the other hand, if you don't take your chances in games like that, then you don't deserve to win and you won't win. And I think that was probably the main difference between the sides was that United, United gave Arsenal two goals and didn't score from easy opportunities themselves. But th there's no question yesterday that Arsenal rode their luck a little bit between the mad swerve on Xhaka's goal, which I'm convinced he did not mean to do, and also a bit of a joke of a penalty call, let's face it. But is there a sense, kind of being devil's advocate about the whole Solskjaer wave over the last month or two, Daniel, that there has been an overachievement so far under Solskjaer? Like, I'm sure you'll have seen the statistics from Optus Orbino on Twitter. For anybody who hasn't seen it, he put up the stat that they've scored 39 goals before Arsenal uh, yesterday, uh, but their expected goals was only 29.8. They conceded 13 goals but their expected goals against was 21.3. They'd played 17 games and won seven penalties, all kind of pointing kind of uh, implicitly to a sense of luck under Solskjaer. Would you go along with that? Uh, no, I think that's a load of bollocks, mainly. Um, I would say back to the penalty. I didn't think it was a penalty at the time. I literally just watched it again and actually think it probably was a penalty. It was a soft penalty. It was a stupid tackle. He put his hand on his back. He pushed him. He fell over. That, 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 that to me is a penalty. But... As far as XG goes, to me anyway, XG is useful for telling you about uh, a big raft of games that you haven't seen. When it comes to games that you have seen, personally, I would always look at what my eyes are telling me that I've seen and what I'm watching and what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking during the game. So, United won the XG 2.5 to 1.5 yesterday. I don't think Arsenal were lucky to win. I don't think United deserved to win because Arsenal scored two goals and United scored no goals. And that stat, that, me that metric is in place specifically to tell you who deserves to win a football game, the score. That's what it's there for. So it doesn't matter that United missed chances. I don't think that's Arsenal riding that up. United didn't score the chances that they made because they weren't good enough to take them. That's skill. For whatever reason, they didn't respond well to the pressure of having the chances. They didn't finish with precision. So to look at it in, a lot, in an overall picture of how United have been under Solskjaer, I would say that as a United supporter... The only game that I've sat there thinking, we're in trouble here, we might not win this one, pretty much was Tottenham. Other teams might have had chances at various points in other games. I don't really think XG tells us what the score was at the time. So if you're beating Bournemouth 4-0 or something, and Bournemouth then have two great chances, I mean, really, so what? I'm not saying that that is the case in the XG of these games, but what I'm saying is XG itself is not a foolproof metric to tell you what happened in one football match. And so... I think that if you look at the PSG game, I'm sure PSG won the XG the other night, but how many serious saves did David De Gea have to make? One? I think I can think of one good save he made and they hit the post once. And if you think about the amount of the ball PSG had, that's not a lot. And that tells you that PSG didn't convert a lot, didn't create a lot of chances, never mind convert the ones that they had. So when I'm talking about games that I have seen, I would always prefer to think about what notes have I made during that game to tell me about how I think that game went. And in general, I would say, I haven't come away from games thinking United got away with one there, apart from against Tottenham. And even then, was that luck? Or was that Spurs not finishing well under pressure? Was that the two great saves that David De Gea made? Having a goalkeeper who pulls off great saves is not cheating. That's literally why he's there. And in the same way we saw that yesterday. I don't think Xhaka's goal was lucky. I think De Gea made a mistake. And he's there not to make mistakes. He's there not to move too early so that he can't recover when the ball moves the other way. So, um, on the other hand... I think that you could say that United have not had luck particularly under Solskjaer, but perhaps have had the run of the ball when there's a ricochet in the box and it goes to a United player. And there wasn't a lot of that yesterday. 
And I think that you might be, you could probably run a more sensible argument saying that sometimes random uncontrollable things still aren't luck, but are random and uncontrollable happen in football. And they went in favour of Arsenal, not United. But if you look at where United were and where they, under Solskjaer, where they started and where they've come, and what you can see now is United, after the first 20 minutes, even though they got beaten, they looked like a team. They looked like they knew what they were doing. They looked like they had a plan and they passed the ball beautifully at times. So if they go from here and then they get beaten by Wolves and then they get knocked out of Europe and then they lose a few more games in the league, then they'll have a problem. But just to look at what happened in that game yesterday, United have played way worse than that at the Emirates and won quite comfortably. And if they play, if they can, if they can, if they create that number of chances against Wolves at the weekend, you'd expect them to win. Do they have uh, still the same difficulties in that squad that we were diagnosing at the start of the season? And while Jose Mourinho was still there, like how how much remedial work does that squad need now for them to be able to sustain it a, a title challenge and a Champions League charge next season? Um, it definitely needs some work. I probably needs. He needs at least one midfielder. I mean, we saw Matic look like someone who hadn't played for three weeks uh, yesterday, but also that's kind of what Matic does. When the opposition are playing well, you can't rely on Matic particularly to stem the flow. I would say they need one midfielder, maybe two, a right winger, and probably and, and maybe a centre back. But I don't think I'll get any. Uh, I don't think any, anyone who supports Arsenal will thank me for saying this. But watching those two teams yesterday, I think it's much easier to construct an argument that United will be able to sustain a title challenge in the near future than Arsenal, who to me played well yesterday, but if that constitutes a really good Arsenal performance, then it's not hard to see why they are why they why they've struggled a bit this season, why they've been on a bad run over the last couple of months after they had that phenomenal run for a little while when they when they kept coming when they kept winning games from half time. But I look at United and I say, well, are there players in this team who I think could create the nucleus of a championship winning team? And who are they? And I think you look at Pogba, Rashford, Martial um, Shaw, who's come on a phenomenal amount in the last three or four months. Um, and you think, well, perhaps Lindelof, who didn't play well yesterday, but those are players who you think could form the nucleus of a side that could challenge for the title. And you look at Arsenal and you think, well, who are those players? You think, well, Ramsey, oh, he's leaving. And after Ramsey, I'm not really sure where you go. You can see some good players like Lacazette and Aubameyang. And if you were to move them, if you were to merge them into one player, they'd be excellent. But do I think, for example, that those two are going to inspire a title challenge? No, I don't. And I don't really see too many others in that team that are going to do that. So I think that there are United, United don't have a midfield that is good enough to dominate the ball and to dominate games against good teams. And that will be the, that, the, the big signing that they require for me in the summer is someone to replace Matic. Might be the Solskjaer doesn't think that that's necessary, but that's what I'd be doing anyhow. Uh, Daniel, to be fair, like I'm not sure. Like you were, I think you were at the game yesterday. Were Arsenal fans realistically talking about winning a title here? I mean, we're talking about steps forward here. And like Nick Harris had a, had a great table up yesterday of all the improvements of all the teams on last season's points. Arsenal are 12 points up on where they were at this time last season. The only team who've improved more on a points by year by year basis is Liverpool, who've got 13 more points than they did at this stage last season. I mean, that's progress from an Arsenal point of view. I don't think anybody's realistically saying that they need to go on and win a Premier League title. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticising you know, Emery, who I think is doing a fine job. Um, he's doing a decent job. What I'm saying is you've got two teams who are fighting, who are, have got, Arsenal got one point more than United, so they're battling to get to the top four with each other this season. What I'm saying is going forward, like the plan for these teams is to, is to step up that level. And when you look at those two teams, I'm just saying, I'm not blaming you know, Emery for this, he's, but I just think that he's going to need a phenomenal amount of money to get that team to where he wants it to be. And I don't think he's going to get that amount of money. And I don't see a lot of players he can rely on to step up to make the difference that he's going to need them to make. It's not particularly a comment on the job that he's doing or even how I think Arsenal played yesterday particularly. It's just an observation watching Arsenal that that looks like a really very big job and a much bigger job than the one that whoever manages United has in front of them. In terms of finishing the top four, obviously that was a big opportunity for Manchester United to leapfrog and to put a bit of daylight between themselves and Arsenal. And... Uh, on its own, that result wouldn't be great. But what happened with Spurs at the weekend suggests that maybe there is a, a chance that both of these teams end up in the top four. How, how damaging is that one defeat to Manchester United and what needs to happen to make sure that it is a one-off as opposed to a, a sequence of games now where they just have a little bit of a, a natural coming off that um, amazing level of form they've been at? Um, well, it's only, it's only ever one game, so it's never going to be too damaging unless it's much closer to the end of the season than it is. But it's obviously a missed opportunity to not put Arsenal out of it, but to open up a lead over Arsenal and Chelsea and put Spurs under some serious pressure. 
I don't think anyone can be sure about which of those four teams are going to finish in, the top, uh, going to finish in those two positions. I guess you would assume that Tottenham will because they're the best, most settled side out of those clubs. And they've got Ali back now. They've got Kane back. So you would imagine they've got enough goals. And in the end, it usually comes down to goals, not clean sheets, which team has, a rel- has reliable goal scorers. Um, I guess I would think that United should be able to finish above Arsenal and Chelsea. And looking at the fixtures, United do have slightly harder games. But then... One of those is against Chelsea and say, so United can do something against one of their rivals. United really less likely to beat Chelsea at home than Arsenal to beat Wolves away, not particularly. So um, it's hard to it's hard to be certain about what's going to happen because also you don't know who's going to have Europe. Well, United have got at least one more round of Europe. Um, Arsenal might be out of Europe on Thursday, which I imagine will be helpful. But then if they were to able to if they're able to overturn three one against Wren, then that is good for momentum. So there are lots of unknowables that is very hard to be specific about, well, this is going to make X is going to make Y happen. Um, I think if United take care of their own performance, that will probably be enough because I don't see particularly reliable teams in Arsenal and Chelsea. And if they, if, if, if they prove to, if they go on a run and they win their, their remaining games, then they deserve what they get. And it's very hard to compete with a team that can reel off that number of consecutive victories. But it just doesn't seem like any of these teams are good enough to do that at this point. Uh, just a quick one on Liverpool, Daniel. Like one of the things that's been spoken about all season, really, at this point, is how Virgil Van Dijk is, uh, without question, the best centre half in the world at this moment. But Rio Ferdinand yesterday uh, in the Sunday Mirror challenging that big time, saying it's Sergio Ramos. He says to be considered the best in the world, you've got to win stuff as well. You cannot just play well for your team and sit there as runner up or coming third or fourth. That's why when people talk about Player of the Year and you see they haven't won anything, but they are the best player. I'm thinking how you haven't influenced a team to win things. You need to be part of a team that is winning uh, to be considered like that. So I think the jury still out according to Rio Ferdinand on Van Dijk's credentials as the best defender in the world in, in a central position um, yeah well, Rio Ferdinand has no agenda whatsoever about his own status I'm sure but I think I, I think what he says is fair to a point where it's not necessarily the case that you have to win something to be considered the greatest but you do want to see someone performing over a period of time and excelling in the biggest games like Rio Ferdinand did and I do think that the idea that Virgil van Dijk has been elevated to this level over the course of a year is a bit much because there are people like I think Jamie Carragher was one. I think I, think, I don't want to misquote him, but I do think I heard Jamie Carragher say he was up there with the greatest defenders we've ever seen in the Premier League era. And I don't think that it would be fair to even rate Virgil Van Dijk above Jamie Van, Jamie Carragher. Never mind any of the others, because Jamie Carragher has performed all the way up to European Cup final and done it over a number of seasons. Whereas what we've seen from Van Dijk is we've seen him play really well. He's the best defender in the Premier League by by a distance. I don't think anyone would sensible would argue with that. But when you start ascribing people's status in the game relative to other players who were around in their era and relative to other players outside of their era, then you definitely need to see a level of consistency over a much longer period of performing in the biggest games and when the trophies are up for grabs. I mean, not everyone agrees with this, but for me, when I'm evaluating the best strikers of the Premier League era, there are players I'd have above Alan Shearer because one of the things that I would use to separate players is what did you do when you were going for titles? And Alan Shearer spent most of his career not competing for titles. And so other people might say, well, look who he was playing with. And he still scored all those number of goals. I would say, well, look at what Thierry Henry did and look at what Ruben Nistelrooy did when they were playing in the, at the highest level of football in the Champions League or when they were competing for titles in England. So I guess it depends on what your criteria are. But Virgil van Dijk, I mean, it doesn't really matter, really. Virgil van Dijk is the best defender in the Premier League. He's definitely one of the best defenders in the world, if not the world. Liverpool will be very pleased that they've got him and other clubs will want to have him. So beyond that, there's not that much to say until Liverpool win something. But they may or they may not do it. But if they don't, it probably won't be because of him. Dan, good stuff. Good morning. Thanks a million for joining us. All right, see you again, guys. Daniel Harris.